Welcome to Dodgers Dogs. As part of the Dodgers Daily Network on a beautiful Saturday morning. Hey, yes, the sun does come up. As Annie said way back when, I'm dating myself with that. Austin, you probably even know who that is. The sun will come out tomorrow, right? It came out this morning. At least it did in Oklahoma. I don't know about Michigan. They got rained out last night. It may get rained out again tonight. But Austin Brubaker, good to see you again. I know you're on Midland, Michigan to catch some Great Lakes Loons baseball. If Mother Nature will allow it. Yeah, we'll see what happens tonight. I'm excited to be here, Casey. Excited to talk some Dodgers baseball today. Absolutely. Let's dive into what happened last night. The Dodgers score only two runs, both on a Shohei Otani home run. So let me make some excuses here. Let me get all these out, and I'm sure Dodgers fans are going to roll their eyes when they hear this. But, hey, the difference between an excuse and a reason can just be just simply just terminology, like, like how you – how you view it, right? So let me kind of give you some excuses, reasons, however you want to look at it there. Brutal scheduling, man. I mean, the Dodgers, two different times in this season, have had long, long stretches of playing back-to-back games with no break. The last one being 12 games. The road schedule has been just crazy insane. I mean, the Dodgers, the, the schedule makers did them absolutely no favors. And so is it expected to see the Dodgers – have a few flat type of clunkers like this with the schedule they've had? Yeah, it, it can be kind of expected, especially when you're coming after a climate in Colorado. You come back home. It's the freeway series. Of course, you'd like the Dodgers to be a little bit more excited, get a little bit of a rival, an inner city rival with the Angels. That being said, with this Dodgers team, you don't want them to have these types of games. It's going to happen during the course of 162 game season. You just hope that this does not become a consistent pattern to where this could be something that happens in October. But last night came up a little bit flat, especially on the offensive side. We'll talk through a whole bunch of different pieces with the Dodgers. Shohei Otani was one of those bright spots, though, had a couple of walks, obviously had the massive home run, did a lot of really good things last night. You absolutely love to see that from Shohei Otani right now, the current Dodgers new leadoff hitter. Yeah, absolutely. I do think to go back to my my last point that I was making, four games in Colorado. Now, I've been to Colorado quite a bit. The University of Colorado is in the Big 12 My dad's been a big eight slash big 12 official forever. Oklahoma State, Colorado, they, hey, welcome back to the big 12 to Colorado, by the way. So I'm very familiar with the Denver, Boulder area. And also Denver back in my childhood, they had a triple A team. So Oklahoma City would play Denver, the Denver Zephyrs, actually. And then they eventually moved to New Orleans. Four games in that altitude. I can tell you, man, that that is not, that is not something that's made up. That altitude makes, I mean, your ears are always popping. It's tough to breathe. It's tough to sleep. And then you add that fourth game onto it, man. That's really, really tough duty, even for the greatest athletes in the world. Yeah, that's that's got to be really tough uh, for these guys, for these players to be able to get acclimated to that. The Dodgers have gone to Colorado quite a bit. It still comes up and that still remains an issue and remains consistent, which could be one of the reasons why. And it could just be to do with the way the pitching schedule was could be one of the reasons why the Dodgers decided to go and throw out a guy like Elena Neck, who has been successful, call him up to give some of these other starters maybe a little bit more of additional rest, give some of the hopefully or at least the game plan going in, give a lot of the pitchers some additional rest as well so then they can have a little bit of that recovery day after four games in Colorado the rest of the team there with the offense didn't really have that opportunity makes it a little bit tough when you traveling back to Los Angeles coming back from those climates which it is tough to play in and perform they just came up a little bit flat yesterday I know those are excuses I get it and you may be rolling your eyes but but Hey, I, I believe it. I, I've been there, and I know how difficult it is just to function at all in that environment. So the flat game, when you look at the schedule, being in Colorado, it's 162. It happens anyways. Nothing really to to make anything too much big out of it. Although the Dodgers, they, they have kind of been that team that scored a whole bunch, one game, not a next. Let's back up to show you Otani. Mentioned about a week ago that Otani – You know, he added that new club in his bag, that Ichiro club, where he kind of was slap hitting everything to left field. 
mentioned at that time that felt like, hey, maybe he's getting a little bit too Ichiro-ish with almost every at-bat, where his feet are moving, his head's moving, just trying to slap everything to left field. Really felt like he needed to anchor himself, get his head steel, get his feet planted into the ground, and dig in and maybe get a little bit more of a charge behind the ball. Seems like, and actually I heard Jose Moda talking about this yesterday, Shohei Otani has gone back to planting the feet, keeping the head still, and when he does that, he is a devastating hitter. Oh, he's absolutely devastating. We've seen it over the past week or so with him planting his feet, just him hitting absolute bombs to center field. And these aren't these aren't cheap center field home runs. These are what yesterday was 455 foot mm-hmm. home runs to dead center field. He can absolutely do that. And this is the power. This is the influence that a Shohei Otani has. And especially when the bottom of the order is able to generate a base hit and get some guys on for Shohei Otani, you can produce that into multiple runs. He's patient at the plate. We saw that with the two walks. One, a little bit borderline pitch on that first walk that he had. You'll still be able to take that. Shohei Otani, if he's able to if he's able to plant his feet is if he's able to keep his mechanics in order to, with the way that we know Shohei Otani can hit, tap into a lot of that power, be patient at the plate and wait for your pitch. There's nobody better in the game of baseball than Joey Otani. Before we move on, and I'm going to do this so I don't forget, it was great to see Kevin Pillar, an old Dodgers farmhand. Dodgers had him a couple of years ago. He actually ended up getting injured. It was kind of tough to see. Wanted to say this. Hey, I messaged Kevin Pillar a couple of years ago. He went out of his way, gave me his, tech, his, his personal phone number, his email. He did all of me. He went out of his way to make sure – that he provided Dodgers Daily an interview. And then also Willie Calhoun, who was one of the big Todd, the Dodgers' top prospects three or four years ago. He actually was before Dodgers Daily when he was with AAA Oklahoma City. I can remember his walk-up song like it was yesterday. Willie Calhoun, who could always hit, never really had a position that the Dodgers could forecast him for as far as being a starter. Hey, he's going to be the starter in left field. or say He kind of moved around. But it was good to see Willie Calhoun – and Kevin Pillar back on a major league roster. I know, Austin, one thing we get to enjoy is covering these guys and then seeing them, even if it's not with the Dodgers, continuing to chase a major league career, even if it's somewhere else. Yeah, no, they've had some good season. They have had a good season this year, and they've had opportunities, especially with the injury to Mike Trout in Los Angeles for the Angels. It's great to see both of them have some success. Good to see both of them continuing to go on their major league journey that's what we love to see we love to see this dodger all these guys come through these dodgers system and the dodgers playing a role for the success of major league players because that means the system that the dodgers have is working and if you look across the numbers of the number of draft picks the dodgers produce you look at the number of guys whose careers are resurgent because of the dodgers That just tells you everything you need to know about the Dodgers and also gives you a lot of trust that not only can they produce players, but they can also turn a lot of players into great players. And you can use that to capitalize on different opportunities that you could have to bolster your your way to a World Series. Absolutely. Great points there, Austin. Well done. Okay, let's get back to the Dodgers. And we hinted on Dodgers dogs about a week ago that – the, it didn't look good for Max Muncy. I mean, the Dodgers weren't able, able to make any uh, substantive. And then whenever they went and got Kevin Biggio, it was like, huh, that, that's not a good sign for Max Muncy. So they officially put Muncy on the 60-day IL and then officially activated Kyle Hurt. You know, Kyle Hurt, to, until yesterday, had been on a rehab assignment. Officially yesterday had to remove that tag. They had to actually activate him and then immediately option him Oklahoma City. Anything surprise you there? Not necessarily with both of those moves. I think you you take a look, especially with the Kevin Biggio trade. This is a, this is one of the points that kind of stood out to me was there's something going on with Max Muncy. It's still going to be a while for him before we're going to be able to see him return in the 2024 season. That is right now. And if we see Max Muncy return in the 2024 season, that's not based off any inside information that I have. That's based off of he still is a long ways from returning and still is waiting to swing the bat right now 
it's going to take some time with him and the production at third base mentioned it quite a bit and it has been mentioned has been significantly down since when Max Muncy was injured since Max Muncy went on the injured list uh, with the Kyle Hurt situation, I think the Dodgers have a lot of guys that they want to keep in their organization right now. I don't think this is an indication of the level of talent that Kyle Hurt has. He is He's insanely talented, a really, really good pitcher. He's going to have a great major league career. You also have a lot of guys that don't have a lot of minor league options. And the guys that do have minor league options, like uh, Alex Vesia, is not going to be sent down right now at the major league level. So I think with the roster as it is currently constructed with, you have guys uh, in this bullpen who the Dodgers have been relying on a guy like an Anthony Banda, who the Dodgers probably want to keep in their organization, at least as of right now, while they're waiting for more guys to be injured. That is, unfortunately means there are limited opportunities for a lot of the younger guys during this current moment. And I think that's where the Dodgers are at right now. I think Kyle Hurt is going to force his way into the major league roster sooner rather than later. This is just the current state of the Dodgers. Yeah, it is. Bonda has been really, really good. Johan Ramirez, he was good again last night for the Dodgers. The whole bullpen has been good. So the Kyle Hurt thing, we'll get in to the Miguel Vargas at third base here in just a second. But the Kyle Hurt thing kind of brings up, I keep hearing that the Dodgers need to go get bullpen help. They need to go get another pitcher for their starting rotation. I keep hearing all this, and then whenever you look up, Landon Knack is doing a great job every time that he comes up for the Major League Club. The Dodgers have so much depth that they can't even figure out a way to get a guy as talented as Kyle Hurt on the 26-man roster so, I mean, it, it confuses me when I hear that the Dodgers need to go add pitching whenever they can't even figure out how to get all the pitching they already have on the 26. Yeah, this is an intriguing conversation because you have a lot of guys for this Dodgers team. A lot of guys that are on this active roster, other also other guys that they've invested in that are on the injured list as well. You talk about a Clayton Kershaw who made his rehab start in Rancho this week. He is on his way back and he will be, once he is healthy, added to this major league roster in some way or form. You have other guys like a Kyle Hurt who just recently came back. You have other bullpen pieces who have been injured that are working to try to find their way back. River We're not Ryan. exactly sure about the status of a Joe Kelly, a uh, Bruce Dark Gratterall, uh, Ryan Brazier, all of these guys that the Dodgers have invested in through the course of this season. So that brings up the conversation of, do you even need to add additional pitching to this Dodgers staff? Do you need to add pitching to this Dodgers team to help make it more fortified, to help make this team as airtight as possible? If there's or, or is there even going to be opportunities for guys to add in when you're already limiting guys? A guy like Alain and Nack, who we'll talk about in just a little bit, had another really solid performance for the Dodgers when you don't have opportunities for a Kyle Hurt. Pitching is if pitching can be intriguing, pitching can be dynamic. Pitching oftentimes there's going to be a lot of injuries, as the Dodgers have stated. And I think a lot of people are concerned, perhaps the Dodgers included, potentially about some of the health of some of their starters, concerned about the Yoshinobu Yamamoto going to the injured list and trying to figure out how long he'll be. I don't know exactly how long that is going to take for him. Concerned perhaps about the Tyler Glass now pitching a whole lot of innings. If something happens to him, if you have both of your ace level pitchers that you went out and got during the offseason, perhaps you need to go and get an ace level after that. Perhaps you're concerned with the way that Walker Buehler has been pitching. There are a lot of guys on this team. There is a lot of depth. The de Dodgers are swimming in a pool of depth in the pitching department right now. There is the old saying that says you can never have enough pitching. When the Dodgers are looking to target guys, when the Dodgers are potentially looking to try to fortify this roster, one, they have to keep that in mind, that things can change over the course of the next 81 or so games, can change in, over the course of the next couple of months, to where if you're having all these injuries during the first 81 games, this can also happen during the last one. 
they're also going to have to figure out a way and this is something that when you have abundance of depth these are rich people problems you're gonna have to try yeah. to f- find a way to figure all of this stuff out and for the dodgers right now especially with some of the superstar level of position players being limited as far as different options for shortstop that role right now very limited as far as other players that could be available from the pitch position player side those ones it's at least a question right now i think the simple solution would be to potentially go out and get additional pitching to fortify this team you're gonna have to wait and see what the health of this team is who is available at the current time and then figure it out from there. So would it surprise me if the Dodgers added additional pitching? Probably not, because I think they don't want what happened last year to happen again. That being said, there is a lot of guys and a lot of talent on this team. And there there has been no reason to say that a lot of the guys who have come up to this Dodgers team couldn't be helpful helpful pieces for the Dodgers going forward. My problem with that is, okay, you say, well, okay, you lost Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Well, who out there is good that you can go get at the trade deadline is going to actually be a legitimate equal replacement to Yoshinobu Yamamoto? Are you actually going to go out and get a trade piece that equals him? That's going to be that's going to be a tough thing. There have been guys right. that potentially have are on one year deals, like uh, has it has been mentioned, like a Jack Flaherty for Detroit, who has struggled in the past, but this season is performing exceptionally well, and all the underlying data backs it up. There might be some guys that you could go out and target. They have to be guys that are going to be good. There have to be guys that are going to be significantly better than the guys that you currently have, or at least they're going to push the bar a little bit more for to help this team if needed to go out and win a World Series, which is why I think you need to wait a little bit to see what's going to happen with the Yoshinobu Yamamoto, see how he is progressing, see, make sure that he is on the right track and to where you could rely on him in a postseason series. And if there is any sort of question with that, and there's still a lot of struggles with some of your other pitchers and the staff, maybe you move forward then. If a lot of if a lot of people are expecting the Dodgers to make a move at the end of June, it's particularly yeah. with the pitching staff. You're going to have to wait a little bit longer, and this is going to be something that the the Dodgers are going to look at. The Dodgers are going to anticipate, but I think they're going to try to be proactive and try to guess what could be some of the issues down the line, or try to uh, try to acquire more depth than they possibly could need going into a potential postseason run. What that means is a guy like a Kyle Hurt, unfortunately, the opportunities may be limited. For other guys that are really good pitchers, opportunities could be limited down the stretch, which sucks for us getting to know a lot of these guys. Dodgers are going to do everything they can to win a World Series this year, and an abundance of pitching depth is something that could be desired for the Dodgers. I just kind of go by the the old school. Hey, if you have if you have one worker, then you have a good worker. If you have two workers, you have half a worker. And if you have three workers, you got none of them. Whenever you're talking about, yeah, it's just like whenever you have so much depth that nobody knows what the hell's going on. I just don't think you maximize anybody that you have there. Whereas if you have a certain amount of guys and they all have a defined role, then you maximize everything you can get out of each guy, and you're actually more efficient at that point. I just think the mass numbers creates chaos, and it just keeps you from from maximizing the value of any and all of the guys that you have that are kind of all in that depth pool. So that's kind of frustrating to me. We'll see how the Dodgers do that. I think you absolutely nailed that as far as the timeline and the thinking of the Dodgers. I will say this, though. We said – I even said it back – I think they went and got Kevin Biggio to be a, a placeholder for Max Muncy. The Dodgers have to figure out third base. They have to figure out third base. I mean, they just have to. You can't – I mean, even if Max Muncy comes back, you don't know how. You don't know how healthy. You don't know what it's going to look like from a timing perspective. And so I don't think the Dodgers, as far as who they've been playing there right now, could – I don't think they have that answer on the roster. One option could be move Miguel Vargas back to third base. You know, they moved him back to third base towards the end of last year. Here's the problem with that, and I understand where they're coming from. As of two years ago, he was playing mainly for first base, or three years ago, however long ago it was. 
And then he moved to third base. And then he, be, he just kind of, as the years went on, he became a little bit better athlete. He just kind of slimmed out a little bit. And then they started moving him to second base a little bit. And then last year, they moved him back to third base. And at the beginning of the year, they moved him in left field. Meanwhile, last year also, they played him a little bit in left field and kind of played him a little bit everywhere. So I understand why the Dodgers are thinking, guys, we've taken this really nice hitting prospect and we've played him in 17 different positions. He never knows where he's going to play. And the next thing you know, I mean, it's like he shows up to the ballpark with no consistency whatsoever. The last thing that we can do to Miguel Vargas as he's trying to reincorporate back into the major leagues with not consistent playing time is also make him actually move positions again. So I understand the again part of it that the Dodgers are trying to avoid with him, but he seems like the the option right now that makes the most sense for the Dodgers. And another reason why I think that could work is that if you do that, then I think that also opens up a a spot to bring James Altman back to the 26-man roster. Yeah, this is a really intriguing conversation because the Dodgers were intentional and have been intentional about making Miguel Vargas a left fielder. And we've been on board with that. We've trusted yes. the organization. We've also stated that this is an opportunity and way for Miguel Vargas to be part of this team going forward in the future. Right now, there is a hole at third base. And so I think the easy inclination from a lot of people, perhaps including the organization with the way that Miguel Vargas is hitting, is to find a way to move Miguel Vargas back to third base because he's had some experience there. Question is, I don't know how often he's been taking ground balls, yeah, if at right. all. His work has been all in the outfield. So that transition back to third base Man, that's that's got to be rough. That's got to be a ton of pressure to put on a guy that you're focused on trying to make him a consistent, good offensive piece, which he has been good during his very limited opportunities with the Dodgers. I want to see Miguel Vargas get comfortable at the plate. I want to see Miguel Vargas fit into the major league club. I think if you throw in all of these additional pieces, it's going to make it incredibly difficult for him going forward. It's going to make it, it incredibly difficult for him to get adjusted while also focusing on all the work that he has to do, do at the plate. If a guy like a Mookie Betts, who is a superstar level player, has insane work ethic, we talk all about him. It still was a, and has been a little mm-hmm. bit of a struggle to get him acclimated to the shortstop position, have him move positions during the season, even though it was during the later parts of spring training. To do that for a guy who is trying to get acclimated, trying to be consistent at the plate, working through all of this, is an insanely tough ask for a guy like a Miguel Vargas. That being said, I think the best case scenario would be to put him at third base and try to find a way to get a guy who's killing it at the AAA level, a guy who was a four-war player in James Alman back into this outfield. I just don't know if the timing is right, and I don't know if this is the best ask and is going to get to the best out of Miguel Vargas right now. It could be that the Dodgers view it as Miguel Vargas has been really – he has been solid at the plate, and we want to see him continue to develop as a left fielder right now. And that transition over to the third base might not be in the cards right now for the Dodgers. It might be something where they have to look elsewhere – perhaps an Andre Lipsius, or perhaps you have to look elsewhere via the trade block. If it's still looking like Max Muncy is not on the path to returning anytime soon, Dodgers are going to have to figure out the third base situation. I totally agree with that. And I've talked to several different players about this. A lot of times catchers who are trying to play an infield position, and they will tell you, especially as it gets hot, and then the games add on like you're kind of in that, you're getting ready to get the dog days of summer Whenever you're having to take – so, like, if you're going from third base to second base, a ground ball is a ground ball, especially in a fungo setting, early work, that type of deal. Yeah, the angle's a little bit different, but it's coming off the coach's fungo. So what you'll do is wherever you're playing that night, you'll take your primary ground balls, and then you'll slip over to your other position and maybe take, like, five, six, maybe ten more ground balls. So the extra grind to that is not all that much more because you've already taken your – 
25 to however many is that day, 25 to 30, maybe 50 ground balls if you made an error or two last couple of games at your primary infield position, and then you've just taken a couple of additional ones at the other one, that's not that big of a deal. So if you're going from one infield position to the other, not a big deal really. But then if you're going from infield to outfield, now all of that grind you just put into your regular daily work that you do with your infield Now you have to put that exact same amount of grind into all of your daily work in the outfield. So it is exact. So whereas you're just kind of adding on a little bit if you're changing infield positions, you are totally doubling up on the workload if you're trying to be both an infielder and an outfielder. And then if you're trying to be a major league hitter that's incorporating in as a guy like Miguel Vargas, where the confidence has kind of come and gone. It's not as easy as say, "Oh, throw him back to third base." I tr- trust me. I, I mean, it sounds like that, but but I you, if you see it every day and you actually see just how much work has to go into both being an outfielder and an infielder from a work perspective. Now, don't get me wrong. Miguel Vargas would run to third base if they told him he was going to be the everyday third baseman. He has an awesome attitude. He'd be like, "Okay, coach. Hey, whatever the Dodgers need, man, just do it." That's exactly how Miguel Vargas would handle that situation because he's that kind of dude. But I'm just telling you, you're adding twice the amount of workload to a guy who is already trying to just – the workload is immense at the plate right now. It's a tough ask. You said it. It's a really tough ask. Way tougher than just getting on social media and saying, well, how how bad could it be to move again? I get all that. I understand that. But but it's it's just tougher than it looks. Hey, Chris Taylor mentioned – Oh, a couple of weeks ago, that ditching the launch angle thing got caught up a little bit too much in it. I've said many different times that he has lift in his swing with a negative bat angle, kind of the Diego Cartaya thing, which means he gets jammed on inside pitches, rolls over the outside pitches at the front of the zone, so that he needs to hit the ball in the back of the zone because that's when he's not lifting his hands. And so good to see him hit the ball to center field, to right field. He is making some really Really nice, not necessarily just all the time, mechanical adjustments to his swing, more so from an approach perspective, adjustments that actually get him in the part of his swing that will allow him to have consistency, which to me is in the back of the swing, letting the ball get a little bit deeper. Yeah, it's been a long journey for CT3 this season. I think he's starting to make those adjustments that are going to turn him around, going to allow his season to be able to turn around. There's still a big league player in Chris Taylor. There's still an insane amount of talent. We've seen it over the years. He's working on making those adjustments. He's working on changing his approach a little bit. You mentioned the launch angle thing, kind of reversing that a little bit and trying to think a little bit more up the center, simplify things, allow the ball to get deeper and allow allow himself to make more consistent contact. Yeah. We've seen that more recently. We've seen him strike out significantly less than yep. what he was exactly. doing before over the past week or two, which is great yep. to see for Chris Taylor. The Dodgers need that type of hitter at the bottom of the order. They don't need all guys who can hit home runs, although I think home runs are great. Yes. If that's going to come with a lot of swing and miss, you want to see those guys go and extend innings, allow some of their hitters, especially if you're at the bottom of the order, and especially if you have Shohei Otani batting leadoff, you want to get to have some of those guys get on base. You don't have to be the hero. You just have to do the right simple things. And I think Chris Taylor, who is an anchor to this Dodgers team, the Dodgers are heavily invested in yep. Chris Taylor. If there's if he's showing signs and he's making the adjustments, he's going to be on this Dodgers team because the Dodgers are heavily invested in Chris Taylor. It's good to see him make all of these turns, all of these turnarounds. It's great to see him make these adjustments. You want to see it continue. You want to see him continue to make good, consistent contact, good swing decisions. Those are some of the things that you're going to be looking for for the Dodgers. And then that complicates things just a little bit in a good way for Dodgers potentially adding some offensive pieces. Mm-hmm. Chris Taylor has hits in back-to-back games, four of his last five and five of his last seven. And again, the hits were to center field and right field. If he continues to play offense like this, he could be the answer to your third base. I'm telling you, this guy's insanely talented. If he's bought in, if he's truly bought into the correct adjustments to thinking up the middle and continuing to trust, letting the ball get deep, not worrying about 
hitting the ball in the air and getting lift and hitting home runs. If he's truly bought into that, he easily could continue on this streak. He's extremely talented and end up being the solution at third base. So I don't I I hear I keep hearing all this DFA stuff. I just don't see any possible way with his contract that Chris Taylor is an option there. Let's have a tough conversation though. Let's throw Chris Taylor in that mix. Chris Taylor, Kike Hernandez, Gavin Lux, Kevin Biggio. Anybody on the anybody any of those guys anywhere is close to being considered for the DFA train. I would say the only one that's considered right now for the DFA train could be a guy like a Kevin Biggio who had, came over to the Dodgers. The Dodgers decided to trade for him. Uh, I think they might be looking for him as a little bit of that stack, stop gap action, stop gap option for Max Muncy as he continues to go forward. The Dodgers also, I feel like, could be comfortable with moving on from him if they needed to. With a guy like a Gavin Lux, who has been struggling a little bit, you do have two minor league options with him. So I would anticipate if the Dodgers Good point. have him and are not comfortable with him being on the major league club to utilize one of those minor league options so you don't have to go down the DFA route unless you are absolutely needing a roster spot on the 40-man roster, yeah. which I think the Dodgers can be creative and try to find a way to figure that out. With Kike Hernandez and Chris Taylor, these are two guys, part of the Dodgers culture. Dodgers paid significant money for both of them, particularly with the Chris Taylor. It's going to take a lot for the Dodgers to move on from them, despite how much they have struggled, despite how much there have been a little bit of a lack of some of that offensive ability for both of them. Kike Hernandez is what a 70 ish WRC plus mm-hmm. on the season. Chris Taylor obviously has struggled quite a bit. I think the only guy on that list right now who the Dodgers would be comfortable designating for assignment would be a Kevin Biggio. But you also need an answer at third base. You also need another player who can take some of that responsibility that Kevin Biggio. And you also might, if you're the Dodgers, you gave up Braden Fisher, very talented pitcher. Perhaps you want to see Kevin Biggio get a little bit more acclimated, see if some of the things can turn around if he works with the Dodgers. You might not want to make an adjustment so quickly. But things got to turn around for him, especially with him not being as entrenched in the Dodgers culture. Mm -hmm. It would be the easy thing to do for the Dodgers to move on from Kevin Biggio in that case. It would. Hey, let's move to the best news of the night. Out of baby Landon Knack. Landon Knack is just such a professional pitcher. The four-point pitch mix, he actually didn't throw his curveball last night, but the four-seam change and slider was just simply fantastic. He's a guy we tell you all the time. He's going to be in the 92-94 range. He can touch 96 on the right night, but that's where he's going to sit. But he is a professional sequencer, and I love that they gave Austin Barnes the game last night because Austin Barnes is so cerebral, the sequences were going to be elite. So if the sequencing was elite, the execution was elite, the movement's good, the, the, the control and the command is good, and so the next thing you know, you got this guy that's throwing 92-94, that you, you, whenever you look at him throw a pitch to home plate, nothing just makes you go, woo. You know, like when he's seeing Gardo and Rico's pitch, you're like, oh, dang. Like nothing's going to make you do that when Landon Knack throws the ball to home plate. Next thing you look up, I mean, he's got like six weak ground balls. He's got a bunch of pop-ups where the hitter feels like they just barely missed it. He's got a couple of strikeouts. And it's like the fifth or sixth inning, sometimes in Oklahoma, he's the only pitcher in Oklahoma City to actually – go a full seven innings last year he's knocked out a bunch of innings and another thing that's very underrated that gavin or excuse me that landon knack does he works very fast he's one of the fastest workers in the game of baseball and i can tell you when your pitcher works fast and throws strikes and then another thing that happens is you know where the location of the pitch is going to be so you kind of cheat to that location, both where you're standing at and then also in your mind you're going, okay, well, he's going away. This guy's going to hit it over here. Whenever you see that and then he actually executes and then they actually hit it there, that that right there, that instinctual, okay, well, he's throwing it to the outer half. I'm going to cheat this way and then I'm going to get a first step here. All of those things when a guy can execute makes you – a just remarkably better defender. So when he pitches, he's going to typically get a lot of great defense behind him. Landon Knack, five hittings pitched, 
Two hits, no runs, two strikeouts, two walks. He knocks down inning, soft contact. Great job, Landon Knack. This is exactly what the Dodgers needed. This is exactly what they asked for. And this is part of the execution that Landon Knack consistently provides. He will provide you with some innings. He will provide you a lot of weak contact. And especially if you have some of the defense behind him, um, helping to make really great plays, particularly at that fourth or fifth inning with Miggy Rowe and Kike Hernandez at the short and third stop, short stop and third base. Lane and Nack's going to go out there and provide excellent performance. He's going to find ways to generate weak contact. We saw quite a few pop-ups, ground balls last yep. night. All sorts of great things that you love to see from a pitcher that has produced consistently at the minor league level. Great to see for Lane and Nack, who got the opportunity. And every time he's gotten the opportunity, he's run with it. Which brings up the earlier conversation as far as the necessity for additional depth. You have a guy like Landon Eck who you can just call up and just go out there and expect him to put up a good performance, expect him to be put you in a position to where you can win the game. That is exactly what Landon Knack did last night, and it was great to see him continue to have great performances at the major league level. By the way, River Ryan is back. We're going to get into him on Down the Farm, so stick around. We're getting ready to get into our Down the Farm segment. We have him. We have James Altman with Josue De Paula. We have the affiliated debut for Wyatt Crowell, who was a fourth-round draft pick from last year's draft. Had a really nice outing for Rancho Cucamonga last night. Probably not going to get a whole lot into Great Lakes. They haven't been playing very well as of late, and they've been getting a lot of rain. Oklahoma City hasn't been playing very good as of late either in terms of offense. Very frustrating. They've been leaving a lot of runners on base, especially third base, with less than two outs twice last night. Had a chance to tie the game. Just haven't been playing really good as of late. Tulsa has been killing it in northwest arkansas this week they've been doing very well skinny henny as we call him the manager of tulsa really has that club turned around it flipped to the second half for the minor leagues so now all the records are zero and zero for everybody as they move forward so a great down on the farm segment so hey austin any final thoughts about the la dodgers before we get down on the farm yeah, the, obviously the Dodgers lost to the Angels last night. It was disappointing. There are still some really good performances, a lot of good conversation to be had about the Dodgers. Still areas that they can improve, but you love to see the performance of Landon Knack. You love to see the increased ability and a Miguel Vargas as he continues to get opportunities. And 455-foot home run for Shohei Otani. That's also great to see. The Dodgers team still going in great places, still in first place, still some things to work out, and that is part of the baseball season. Absolutely. Hey, with that, let's not waste more time, Austin. Let's get right to it, and let's take a trip down on the farm. All right, as we start our down on the farm segment here, Austin, this is left-hander that just got called up to Rancho. Hey, you know, the complex Rancho is the first affiliated. So when I say he got called up for his first affiliated action, that just means he got called up to one of the affiliates, the lowest affiliate being Ran the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. This is Wyatt Crowell, and he was a fourth-round draft pick out of Florida State, who, by the way, has had a great year, made it to the College World Series. A guy that has a, a – look at that slider. Nice little slider slash cutter pitch. He has a good changeup. And a fastball that's going to sit low to mid-90s. Lots of good movement. And he's more about control than he is command. He's kind of one of those guys that's effective because you're not exactly sure where the ball is always going to be within the strike zone. So a good outing for Wyatt Crowell, who went three innings last night for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. Yeah, this is great to see. This is one of those guys that we talked about during the draft show that we did last year. Fourth round pick, spent some time. He was injured, been working his way back. It is great to see Wyatt Crowell pitch for the first time with a Dodgers affiliate last night with Rancho Cucamonga. That is great to see. I think he's got some wicked stuff from all of the reports I've read. And now being able to see him pitch in action there's a lot of stuff that this Dodgers organization can work with. You talk about the movement that he pitches with. Talk about a little bit of the velocity. This Dodgers team in this Dodgers organization is going to have a blast trying to make Wyatt Crowell the best version of himself. Last night was the first taste of affiliate action. It will. It is far from the last 
taste of affiliate action from Ryan Coel. You're going to be hearing about his name a lot going forward in the future because I think that talent is absolutely there. It absolutely is. So, made to Rancho, drafted last summer, fourth round, as we mentioned. Just got back off of injury. So, he's been fighting injury. Just got back off of injury the end of May. He had four outings in the ACL, which is the Arizona Complex League, not interior cruciate ligament. So, he made his debut last night with the Rancho. Good tail and fastball, good depth, and bite to the slider and a tumbling change. So, White Correll did a good job last night for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. Awesome. Next guy we want to get to right here on your screen. This is the young man. Josue De Paula had another really nice night last night. Had a couple of hits. As a matter of fact, third multi-hit game in a row, and he's seven for his last 12, and he has hits in six games in a row. He's raised his average. Josue De Paula has 26 points in the last six games, and also I know foot speed is one of the things that people always want to know about him. Stole two bases last night, now has 14 stolen bases on the year. Yeah, and you mentioned the 14 stolen bases, weighted stolen bases at 2.3, which is the best uh, for Rancho Cucamonga right now. Josue De Paula, their best and most efficient base dealer uh, right now on the season so far, perhaps not as fast as Kendall George, but as far as being efficient, he's been incredibly well. And you talk about the offensive production on this season. He's drawing quite a few walks. He's eliminating some of the strikeouts to only about 22%. uh, Has a 129 WRC+. plus. I think the power potential is absolutely there in the bat. You combine that with his ability to steal bases. You combine that with his patient plate approach at the plate. And you have a really good player. I think there's good reason for Dodgers fans to be excited about a host way to Paula as he continues to go forward, continues to make these progressions. And he's still only 19 years old, still incredibly young. Uh, he's going to continue to make proper adjustments, continue to learn at his craft. And if he leans into that development, if he leans into that growth and leans into this Dodgers coaching staff, the world is the potential for host way to Paula. Okay, man, as we move up to the single or the, the high level, I should say, we're back on the screen here. Uh, take over the, the Great Lakes Loons. I know they got rained out last night. It's been a little bit of a struggle for them as of late. Yeah, so the first half officially ended on Thursday. So yesterday, Friday night, was supposed to be the start of the second half. I know the guys were really excited to get started with the second half as it's kind of a little bit of an opportunity refresh for the Loons. Leading up into the series, they were already eliminated from first half contention. There was a little bit of a dud, especially on the offensive side. Not a whole lot to talk about. Peter Hubeck was one of the bright spots. I was at the game Thursday night, got to see him go out there and pitch for the Great Lakes Loons. And I think he has been so under, perhaps underrated. He's just been so rock solid, consistent for the Great Lakes Loons on the pitching staff. He's been effective at striking guys out. Big breaking ball is there. He's able to command the zone quite a bit. I know the strikeouts might be, or the walks, I should say, might seem a little bit inflated. I think that's just because Peter Hubeck, with the way that he attacks hitters, is looking to get and try to find ways to entice hitters to chase. Likes to dance around the zone a little bit at times, but he has been incredibly efficient. And you saw the grittiness on Thursday night for Peter Hubeck loaded the bases fifth inning tied game at zero and he found a way to get out of it without giving up a run to continue to have a great performance on him pitched five scoreless innings he's striking out 35 percent of hitters right now which is insanely good he has a 2.52 ERA and the FIP and expected FIP are not far behind it Peter Hubeck has been so incredibly rock solid for the Great Lakes Loons pitching staff. And this is a continuation of the success that he had even from last year at the high A Great Lakes level. Great to see for Peter Hubeck. It absolutely Go is. Ahead, so Dave. as we move up to the double A level, the first guy that I want to talk about is Diego Cartaya. Diego Cartaya has absolutely been smoking hot as of late. And this is in Northwest Arkansas. 
How about this momentum? He's that right there. That's the big deal. We talk about that all the time. Getting in, uh, getting to that inside pitch. See how this pitch got in on him right here. See how he got to it. He got enough barrel on it. Still got in on the hands just a touch, but enough barrel on it to get it out and find grass into the outfield. And so it's good to see him get to that pitch. He has hits in four games in a row, seven of eight, and he's eight for his last 14. So Diego Cartaya, good to see him have momentum. Great to see him have momentum. You love to see this from the guy who has been working so incredibly hard at everything. And you all of a sudden look up, you start to have a little bit of success. And now Diego Cartaya has a 110 WRC+. plus. That is great to see. The process continues to be working on it. He's finding ways to get in on some of those inside pitches. He's working on ways to be effective. Diego Cartaya starting to have a lot more success. You're seeing the work behind the plate that he puts in every each and every single day. He can throw runners out. He can go ahead and hit a home run every once in a while. He can have a lot of success at the plate. You love to see this for this guy who has been working so hard, starting to have a lot of success. Diego Cartaya, don't give up on him. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Also, at the AA level, if I can get my video here, let me flip over to Alex Freeland, who has been just simply fantastic this year. Alex Freeland, a switch inning catcher that has stolen 30 bases in his career before and has a world of power, has a chance to hit 20 home runs this year. So if you can't get excited about Alex Freeland, I don't know what you can get excited about. This dude has a WRC plus of 152. He plays good defense. He has He's approaching 10 home runs on the year at the halfway. So chance to be a 30-20 guy. This is a guy, Alex Freeland, that is immensely talented. Yeah, so this is something I talk a lot about. And right now, he's technically at the minor league level in second place and weighted runs above average. If you look at his combined numbers with both Great Lakes and Tulsa, 176 WRC plus with a little bit more walks than strikeouts. He's batting 303 uh, with a 524 slugging, 455 on base percentage, combined numbers on the season. He's stealing a lot of bases as well. He's going ahead and hitting for some power. His ISO is at 221. Alex Freeland, it has been perhaps the biggest story for the Dodgers at the minor league level this season. He's a shortstop that plays rock solid defensively. You can also move him around to second base and third base if you absolutely needed to or if you wanted to have that versatility. He steals bases on a regularly. Last year, you mentioned had 30 stolen bases. Now we're seeing the consistent plate approach, the consistent ability to draw walks, the limited ability to strike out while also putting up pretty solid, especially gap to gap power for an Alex Freeland. You talk about guys in this organization, you talk about guys in this system, and we say we've said it in the past. There is no real untouchable player in this system. We've also mentioned that if we had to choose, perhaps it's like a Dalton rushing and an Gardo Henriquez. I'm not convinced that yeah. Alex Freeland is not an untouchable prospect for this Dodgers right now. You talk about a need for Good the point. Dodgers going forward at the shortstop position, and there's a lot of talented shortstops. This is nothing against a Trey Sweeney or a Noah Miller or any of the other shortstops that this organization has. Right now, I'm so incredibly high in Alex Freeland that I would be it would be incredibly difficult to include him in any sort of trade package because I see the potential to be there of him being at least an op option, at least an opportunity for him to be a future shortstop for the Dodgers. Doesn't mean you don't go after guys during free agency, but with the way that Alex Freeland is playing, he has all the skills, all the tools to be able to use that and become an effective big leaguer. He's just that good, and he's playing just that well. And all of the momentum is with Alex Freeland. You absolutely love to see it for a kid who's worked so incredibly hard mm -hmm. his entire life and has overcome a ton of challenges. Alex Freeland, free. Do not forget that name. And if you have a list of untouchables, put him on it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move up to the AAA level. We have let you in on the ground floor of this guy. I was super glad. You know, Bruce Koontz just did a feature on the relievers that kind of have, have hopped onto the scene this year. 
And I was glad to see that he added Sauer and Lau to this to this list. And then also Jack Dreyer, the Maytag, I saw he was on there. That was super exciting. Sauer and Lau, we've been telling you, of course, he was a position player, got all the way up to Great Lakes as a position player. Didn't work out, so transitioned to pitching. I got to see him for the first time earlier this year in Wichita. And, man, my first comment was, wow, this dude's ball, like, really hops. I mean, it's explosive. He's very – just his, he's not real tall, but it's just – he has a physical presence to him that's kind of – see that arm side movement there? That's intimidating. And then he's also had that arm side run to it. And then that little cutter slash slider pitch that turns left, that one there. So you saw the, the right turn to the to – the, let me back that up and show you both of these last two pitches – just so you can kind of see it. Watch the right turn here. See that right turn. Let me back that up. And I'm going to get, get this halfway to home plate. And let me back that up halfway to home plate and show you right here. Okay, so watch this ball. See that ball move right, Austin? Look at that right turn. That's incredible, isn't it? Now let's watch this next pitch. And then let's watch the left turn. Now good luck when that's coming in about 96 as a hitter. And it's coming out of the exact same tunnel. And you don't know whether it's going to turn right or turn left. This is a guy, he actually reached out to me the other day and thanked me for uh, the coverage that I've given him as a pitcher. said, man, you don't need to thank me. You've been killing it. Just keep doing what you're doing. I was so excited to see Bruce Koontz add Sour and Loud to the list of guys that you need to put in your Rolodex all the way up. You don't know what a Rolodex is, by the way. All the way up to AAA for Sour and Lau. Exciting, man. Oh, this is so exciting. This is one of the guys that, I mean, if you look at the numbers last season, first year pitching, yet he was as effective as a Kyle Hurt at generating yep. swings and misses. So you knew the arm talent was there. You knew the ability was there. The Dodgers absolutely found a steal in a Sarin Lau who was struggling at the plate transitioned over to pitching and he has absolutely run with it this season has been so incredibly good for him uh just combined numbers with both double a and triple a having a 1.75 era 255 fip 337 expected fip he's striking out just about 30 percent of hitters he's limiting some of the walks he's still generating a lot of swing and misses with the swing and strike percentage at just over 16 percent one of the better ones in this system you see the movement on his pitches and i thought it might have been he i thought he was going to stay at the double a level too. just transitioning into this season for a little bit longer just just with the expectation but Sarin Lau, who started off last year, first year pitching in Rancho, he is flying through the system. <laughs> and there's very good reason for that. The movement is incredible. The swing and miss ability is there. Sarin Lau, part of a group of promotions that I'm sure we'll have to highlight on the show as well. There's good reason to be so incredibly excited about this guy. And this is one of the great stories in this Dodgers system. The guy who made that transition from the field to the mound. Great to see him have success in his AAA debut. I expect a lot more success for him at the AAA level before eventually you're going to see the converted position player, Sarin mm -hmm. Lau, make the transition to the major leagues as a pitcher. Yep. That's going to be such an exciting day, and such uh, uh, it's going to be it's going to be a celebration for everybody in this organization, and especially for Sauron Lau, for his friends, for his family. So great to see him have success. That's why I, the, the story that the article that Bruce did. He also he had Maytag. I mentioned he had Sauron Lau. He also had Edgardo Enriquez, and then he also included Lucas Webb. That's why I always say whenever you're dealing with prospect coverage, yeah, top thirty prospects list are great. But the guys that get to see these guys every day and see their grind and are connected to the organization who understand the guys that actually have momentum within the organization like a Bruce does. When those guys write articles, uh, we like to think ourselves maybe in that category as well. Those are the ones that you really pay attention to. So make sure and go check that out on Dodgers Digest. He did a great breakdown of all those guys and every single one of those guys. And there's some other guys, too, that, that easily could be on that list. That's just There's too many to get to. That, yeah. that you could talk about. But definitely the ones that he hit, go check that out. It was a great article, and those guys deserve the coverage that he gave them in that article. So, uh, hey, let's get to the AAA level, and obviously a very exciting night last night for River Ryan. We're actually going to get right here to River Ryan. There he is, and boy, what a 
start that he had last night for AAA Oklahoma City. Kind of bad news. Ben Kasperius got put on the IL with an oblique injury. Obliques are no good. I, I don't trust obliques as far as recovering in any kind of timely manner. So very bad news for Ben Kasperius, who is having the best year of his professional career. But with Ben Kasperius going to the IL, it's good to see River Ryan getting back. You had a great uh, debut last night. Not debut as far as he threw. He did throw once with Rancho, but debut with Triple A Oklahoma City. Yeah, that's great to see River Ryan back. First, best of luck to Ben Kasperius. He's going to be able to come back at some point, and he, there's talent is still there. Everything we've talked about him with the upside that he has is still going to be there, Ben Kasperius. So I still believe in that. Yeah. River Ryan, we've it's been a while since we've seen got a chance to see him pitch at the upper levels of the minor league system. It is so good to see yeah. River Ryan back. And you talk about the depth of this organization, the depth of the system. This is one of those guys that has to be in that conversation for the Dodgers and their system. The movement is nuts. The spin rates are really good for River Ryan. He is such a good pitcher. He's able to locate well. He's able to generate swings and misses. And now that he's starting to get back in the swing of things, now that he's back in Oklahoma City, the arm talent is there. It's going to be about opportunities, and the Dodgers are going to have to find a way to get this guy up in their system because he's just that good and just that talented. As you see, those pitches are nasty. Yeah. Well, and don't forget, he was not eligible for the Rule 5, so the Dodgers did not have to put him on the 40-man. So the first hurdle they'd have to cross with him is to figure out, you talked about getting creative if the Dodgers ever needed to add a 40-man spot, like with the Gavin Lux deal, to add like a River Ryan, something like that. Of course, you could use the 60-day IL like we've seen the Dodgers do. You'd have to figure out how to get him on the 40-man uh, first. But, hey, as we're talking about River Ryan here, Austin, any final thoughts of anything that has happened down on the farm? Yeah, there's there's been a lot of good action for the Dodgers. We There's also been a couple of promotions that are noteworthy as well, obviously. Uh, Robo, Justin Robleski yeah. coming up and making, I believe tonight is going to be his Oklahoma City debut. If not, it's coming up really soon. A guy like a Lucas Webb, who yep. is mentioned in that article that Bruce wrote. He made the transition. Now he's up in Tulsa. Had a really good performance as well. There's a lot of good movement within this Dodgers organization. You also got to see a performance back a couple of days ago from a guy like a Jose Rodriguez at the yes. minor league level, who very well could have been put in that article. He was the first one I was thinking of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he's generating so much swings and mi swinging misses. Uh, this Dodgers system is deep. This Dodgers system is talented. There's so many good players within this system to where you're not able to call up guys that are having good performances, great years, and like a Ryan Ward and Andre Lipsius and Drew yeah. Avens. But there's so much depth. There's so much good things happening within this Dodgers system. Even if the first half championships are there, continue this work, continue this progression. I think a second half championship is going to be had for one of these affiliates. There's just too much talent to be had within this Dodger system. I look forward to the second half. I look forward to the challenges that present itself. And I think you're going to see that fire reinvigorate itself, especially with a team like Ray Lakes, especially with a team like Tulsa, who started to turn things around. I think you're going to see a lot of good competitive teams for the Dodgers in this organization during the second half. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, Austin, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for joining. As always, you did just an absolute knockdown, drag out, awesome job. So thank you very much, and we will see you sometime next week. <laughs> okay, man. Hey, for everybody, I want to thank you for tuning in and say go Dodgers, beat the Angels.